What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Schmo Zone podcast. This is Dave Schmolenson, aka the Schmo. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Mon. Blue Mon, stay true to what makes you different. The Schmo, Dave, myself, I love this product. I use their fifth sample styling mask pomade. This stuff's great. My routine is I take their volume cream, I put it in my hair, I blow dry my hair if I have time. I'll let it, I'll let it uh, get some air dry too. Just depends on the mood I'm feeling. Then I put this stuff on and it holds great. I absolutely love it. I highly recommend you get their Discovery Styling Kit. It's great. Everyone has different textures of hair. You can find out what your texture is and experiment. Get 10% off by using the promo code SHMO at checkout. Go to bluemon.com and get you some. Today's other episode sponsor is Fusion CBD products. There's a lot of great choices for your CBD out there, but Fusion CBD products is what I use. I absolutely love it. They have some instant freeze relief. They got some rub. They have energy and focus, sleep and recovery. They have their tinctures and they have their Fusion CBD sports water. I love this stuff. Just worked out. We're going to be talking for about an hour on the show. Be sipping on this for the show. Podcast guests will be sipping on this for the show. Great stuff. Go to FusionCBDProducts.com, get 20% off using the promo code SHMO. Let's start this episode. Hey, 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 welcome to another episode of the Schmo Zone podcast. I believe this is episode number 27. I'm Dave Schmolenson, aka the Schmo. My co host is Helen E. Sports. Gotta, gotta leave that in there. Gotta emphasize the sports. Um, today's guest is gonna be Jared Flash Gordon, UFC fighter. Fights in lightweight, fights in featherweight. He's going to be hopping on here in a little bit. But I figure before we begin, we have so much. We haven't been able to talk about, like we were on Fight Island for three plus weeks. I don't think we truly fully addressed that. And when was the last time, Helen, you and I had a chance to like sit down, just you and I, without having a guest and just chopping it up? Too long to remember, right? Feels like a few months ago, I feel. Probably during the quarantine. Like yeah, the bulk I mean, of when it. it like first shut down and... We literally were doing it in the guest bedroom. We were doing it in the guest bedroom, and uh, now we're back in studio. It's uh, it's a lot more comfortable doing the podcast here than on the road, even when we're doing it on our couch or in Abu Dhabi um, in the media room with Paul Felder and whatnot. Um, this is a lot better. I like the studio a lot. I like the, the schmo cave, the schmo zone cave. Exactly. Me too. It's very comfortable in here. So where do you want to start? Uh, first off, happy birthday to my younger brother, Richard. He's a huge supporter of the show as well. He actually shares the same birthday as Tom Brady, which I feel you'll like that little fact. And it's his 24th birthday, not 23rd? Yeah, 24th. 24th, yeah, because no one likes... Super young. Super young. No one likes you when you're 23. Shout out Blink-182. That's a great So reference. maybe they'll like him now. They'll like him when he's 24. Uh, he's a big Kobe Bryant fan. 24, he, the Kobe oh, year. Oh, he is. Happy yeah. birthday, Richard. Yes, happy birthday, Richard. And also, congratulations. You're not only Dave Schmolenson, a.k.a. The Schmo. You are now in a World MMA Award nominee for Personality of the Year. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, very humbling and very, very flattering. I, It came out of nowhere. Uh, shout out to Oscar Willis from <laughs> Mac Life because I think he texted me randomly at like 7 a.m. It was about a month and a half ago when the nominations came out. He's like, congratulations on your nominee. I'm like, for what? Like, nominee for what? He's like, World MMA Awards. I'm like, what? Really? And then I looked it up and I was just shocked. And to literally be nominated on the same panel is Joe Rogan, someone I highly look up to. Exactly. Uh, John Anik, the legend. We've had him on Chael the podcast. Sonnen, we've Sonnen, had Sonnen, him on the podcast as well. The bad guy. Um, Big John, John McCarthy. Yes. 
It is so humbling to just be on a panel with those guys. And um, man, if you were to tell me this a couple of years ago that you'd be nominated for personality of the, of the year and an MMA, like I'd say, shut the fuck up. I would have no <laughs> idea. And I'm just so blessed and so grateful. And I appreciate everybody. And uh, go to World MMA Awards. Yeah, vote for the schmo. He won't be up there as Dave Schmollinson, so as the schmo. And how does that feel, though? I want to be the first one to be able to ask you a question on how everything feels. You know, you basically, as far as for a lot of people, majority of people, and I think you and I can agree on that, they discovered you after the press conference, UFC 236 in Atlanta. And I remember you texting me right after and telling me you did it. You asked Dana White the question. And then... So quickly, within a year and a few months, everything has unfolded the way it has. And I know I've seen it firsthand that how hard you work, you deserve everything. Um, so how do you feel about just kind of this whirlwind this past year and a half? I mean, can you pinch me? It kind of doesn't feel real to an extent. It's been a crazy 15 <laughs> months. And actually, my dad and I were talking about it on the phone last night. Right before that press conference in Atlanta, I rem he recalled in the conversation, this is either going to make me or break me. They're either going to escort me out and I'll never be able to cover a UFC event again, <laughs> or um, I will rise. And this was the viral sh moment I was looking for. I just needed eyeballs on me. It's People don't understand the seven plus year grind it, uh, since 2012 uh, when mm -hmm. I graduated college that it was to get to this point. And when I trademarked and created the character in 2015, it, it, it's been a complete whirlwind. Um, and there's been so many highs, so many lows in this roller coaster. And right before that press conference was literally my breaking point. It was the make or break, the custard's last stand for me. And it happened. And um, a lot of people, you know, think it's just like this quick come up, but it was years of preparation. And I think if you you take the time to search what the Schmo character and I guess my name is about and what I've done to get here and and the jobs um, I've I've been involved with to be at this point, um, I'm just truly blessed and everything happens for a reason. I'm just so grateful that we are here today. I do have to add to that. Not only you know do is it because your hard work that helped you you know get that moment but even afterwards every single day you continue to work so hard i thought i was the hardest working person in the room until i met you and I vice versa i thought i was the hardest working person in the room until i met you and i think that's what drew us together yes and of course we are better together as a team but i will say so many people from observation when they get that huge sh moment right or breaking moment and they start to put themselves on cruise control they're like you know what i got my moment and now i can relax a little bit take my foot off the gas pedal but you literally every moment of every day you're constantly grinding we're always thinking about work what can we do better what can we do next and that's what i love just your continued hustle to be the best not only that you can be but to reach all your dreams and everything's unfolding and it's really cool to see everything firsthand thank you thank you and, and maybe to a fault um, you and I or I'll speak for myself we we work too hard I mean uh, <laughs> oh, you're, you, yeah. you you um, you press it uh, you know when to, to hey let's just cool down like last night you put me to the side let's just turn on some TV we watch some basketball we relaxed, we got our mind off work just for a couple hours. We yeah. could use the escape. But it's interesting because I feel like now more than ever because of this pandemic and the situation we're in, we have to be even more creative than mm -hmm. we were before to uh, create content, um, grab interviews. We're just so lucky that we're covering so much UFC that we're tested for COVID at least twice a week. Who else gets tested for this at least twice a week? It's such a blessing. So we're nowhere safe. We know that the athletes that we're interviewing are safe and uh, we're able to continue going forward. Man, uh, just the, the last thing I could say on this is I couldn't be in this position in a COVID era. Like I'm just so happy the timing of everything. There's so much in life. Timing is everything. It really is. And the timing could not have worked out any better. And um Again, I just can't express my gratitude and I will do whatever it takes the rest of my life to give back and to help people achieve their dreams and um, 
you know, I feel like you and I are literally the epitome of what the American dream is. Like, you know, you're going to struggle. You're going to survive on minimum food and make sacrifices. And literally at one point, the sacrifice for me was, am I going to pay for my radio show Eyes on the Game or am I going to eat food? I mean, that literally was something I had to ask myself. And it's funny, too, because when we were starting the Schmo Zone podcast, when we were getting ready to launch, we went to, uh, you know, we were contemplating the radio route. We were contemplating doing yeah. your background, your your connection there. And I'm so glad we didn't, aren't you? You could say that twice. <laughs> you could say it twice. So. Bold italics, though. All right. We're on the same page. Let's go. <laughs> yes. And also being uh, one of the only ones doing in-person interviews, like you mentioned, because we are constantly getting tested. And I feel like what you were saying, how, you know, everything in life is balanced, right? If you do too much of one thing, of course you, I mean, it's great to work hard and everything, but you got to kind of find that balance. And I'm glad that we are finding that balance in working out. So this week, a little fun fact, and for those who try to ask me about swimming, which I, I don't like to update too much on it just because I want to be a doer, not a sayer. I don't want to be like every two minutes talking about the swimming stuff. I want to literally be doing stuff on the back end and come out looking fast. You know, I don't want to come out and I hate to say it, but I don't want to suck. You know, I don't want to flop. So this week we're meeting with a strength trainer and it's my, or a strength coach and my, it's my first time working with a strength coach. Yeah. Um, I think you brought it up on a former show that, you know, I did have a, I do have a background in personal yes. training. That's what I did to pay the bills to literally pay to intern in sports media and in my first internship, my first job in this business outside of college. And, um, you need to be able to recognize what you're good at and what you're not good at. And I, you got to make a choice. Am I going to be your boyfriend or am I going to be your trainer? Am I going to be your coach? And I'm going to be your boyfriend. I'm going to support you. And I, I, there's a lot I don't know about it. And what you need is more than what I do know. So I recognize that. I support you. I can't wait to just get a sweat while he focuses on your goals, this trainer that we're meeting with, and we can talk more about it at a later time. Let's mm -hmm. let's go through the first session first. Let's get <laughs> you going. But I can't wait for you to really learn powerlifting uh, uh, for strength training. That's really going to help you with your swimming goals. Proper technique, proper form, build on that proper explosive strength that you're going to need in the 50 free, the 100 free, and if you do compete in the 200, I'll help you with. Uh, he'll help you with your cardio and your stamina for that. Um, I'm just really excited for you to uh, work with someone who's one of the best at his crafts, and uh, we can leave it at that. Yes. Um, so that's that to me is really great. Can I say one side note too? Not yeah. to not to move off topic here, but we will move off topic here. Slide over to the your right a little <laughs> bit. Show the audience you are wearing a chicken feet shirt. I think your hair is a little oh. bit in the way right there. Chicken feet. Sporting your Good for the soul. Sporting your favorite food, the most disgusting thing <laughs> that I've ever put inside my mouth. You know <laughs> Really? Yeah. Probably. That is oh, yeah, okay. I've had kangaroo, I've had alligator, <laughs> the taste of Chicago um in the summertime. Um yeah. I know they didn't have it this year, obviously for for real reasons. Yeah. Um but uh, they would have like exotic foods and stuff oh. like that. I think I had but, shark alligator there, but, but chicken, chicken feet. feet. Yeah, like when we go to dim sum with my parents and we'll have chicken feet, I just, I always have to have them order two of them, you know, two like uh, dishes of chicken feet. And yeah, I mean, I would say maybe it's tied for my first favorite food because the Helene pizza at Naked City Pizza, shout out to them. Uh, it has french fries on top. So if you guys want to try something unique, not chicken feet unique, but it's a bit different See Helen has a pizza <laughs> named after her. I don't have anything like that. Well, I'm a, you're, I, you're the big timer big timer here Big time eater. I used to weigh 217 pounds. Yeah, I've, I've <laughs> never been that much The highest I've ever weighed was 196. You got me there, which is incredible, which is but you obviously yeah, those yeah. days are way behind you now. You've seen the pics. I have. I have. Yeah. But here's the problem. Let, let, let me tell the audience my <laughs> problem with Chinese food and why oh, wow. I love Asian food, but it's not as good. It's third. It's not or actually fourth. I think fourth. Vietnamese food's better. I think Korean food's better. And I do think Japanese food's better. Here's the problem with Chinese food. 
there are way too many bones in the food. They are so lazy That's when the they best prepare. Part. And no, and just like chicken feet, you're eating a million bones. The, but even the chicken and all the different types of foods, there's so much bones in there, and 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 they're lazy on the flavor. Too much sodium, MSG. You know, you know it. Well. My dad doesn't cook with MSG, but that's a separate story. But he loves the bones. Like, he's always at the end of every meal growing up. If we have something like fish, pork, beef, whatever, it's like you give him the bones, you know? And he, the bones absorbs all the flavors. And even with chicken feet, I mean, there's, you know, the bones, even the nail. Like, that's what makes it authentic. That's what makes it good. And you want me to walk out of here? Listen, give or me some Thai food <laughs> first, some pot Thai, some curry Green chicken curry from Thai food. Give me some Vietnamese food, some pho. Korean food, whether it's Korean barbecue, bibimbap, I'll take that. <laughs> Hot stone plates and Japanese food. I mean, come on, sushi, bento boxes. All that is good. That's all greater than Chinese food. And sorry wow. to hurt your feelings, but it's just the facts. You guys listening to this? I mean, the, this could be the beginning of the end. I'm just Listen, kidding. if any of you no. think Chinese food is greater than those foods, let us know. Let's, <laughs> we can even take a poll on this in the future. Do you think Derek Lewis likes chicken feet, though? Hell no. He Remember, there was a video of Derek Lewis, who is fighting this week, by I the know, way. Shout out to event. Derek Lewis. Yeah. Big fight for him. Um, maybe that's why you're wearing that. I know you like him. But anyways, long story short, or no story short, um, <laughs> there was that video of him in the grocery store in Houston where he trains and where he lives during the beginning of the pandemic. They're literally out of meat, poultry, chicken. He's in the aisle and all he sees is chicken feet <laughs> and he takes a video of it. I have to think he's thinking about you while he does this. He says, this, oh, fuck this, fuck no. And he throws it, doesn't eat it. There's hell, hell no, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, how can you blame him? How can Derek you blame him? Lewis, one of the greatest personalities in the sport, man. I, I appreciate him for being such a great sport. When I gave him chicken feet, almost last winter. Yeah, I'm waiting for him to. Um, I'm waiting for him to send us. Uh, he's okay. That shirt that I, he's promoting. Come on, Derek. Yeah. I I want to wear a he's okay shirt, but it told me it wouldn't arrive on time. So I'm like, okay. So fine. you just got to make the. I, most I gotta of it. wait. Yeah, so um, now it's been a week, a full week now, um, that we've been back from Fight Island. Oh my, only a week. Only a week. I feel like we accomplished so much this week it's, on the back it's end It's been nonstop. Things. So we landed here at 4.30 a.m. And I literally, mm -hmm. until last night, when we took that couple hour break, I think we've just been going nonstop because we covered the weigh-ins for Friday for this UFC fight night. Um Fortunately, the Golden Boy lost, but it was a great test against Derek Brunson. He's only going to learn. He's 22 yeah. years old. Only. Um, you know, he's the, unfortunately, he's the first guest now that's come on our show during fight week and unfortunately uh, didn't get the victory. Hey, not everybody can win. He will be back. He's 22 yes. years old. And who was sitting here for the last show? Future champion. Edmund Shabazian. Future champion. Yes. All Definitely. the tools. All the tools. He's still growing into his body. And it might not even be at middleweight. It could be at light heavyweight. It could be at welterweight. Who knows? The options are there. The yes. options are there. So uh, Saturday, then we quarantined for that fight. Mm -hmm. And it was just nonstop. Um, what we do is for these fight nights is uh, we check into the hotel room with our COVID test from 6.45 to 7.45 a.m. And then we literally are there for six, seven hours. If we don't hear from them, we know we're negative. And then we... Um, we go over to the Apex and we cover these fights. We're actually going to be quarantined again tomorrow because Contender Series Week 1 starts tomorrow. Yes, so. Week 1 starts tomorrow, so we're doing the same thing. We're covering that. Um, very, very exciting times. We'll loop back to that, but let's let's start with where we're going with Fight Island. Uh, yes. What were your overall takeaways from Fight Island for the audience here? I think something that you and I can both agree on and what we've been telling basically everyone that we've come across is how safe we felt there. And I felt like everything was extremely clean. You know, I felt they did such a great job with uh, all the protocols ensuring, especially during the first 48 hours that we were quarantined. I, I know towards the end, you're like, uh, you know, looking at the people, did they give us the wristbands yet? But I feel they need to enforce, you know, the strictness to have us be able to, you know, um, 
make sure everything runs smooth, I guess I'll put it that way, because everything did go great on Fight Island. I had such a great experience um, from, you know, obviously all the amazing fights that went on to um, being able to golf, uh, do the F1 racing, I believe it's called F1, and then do the Yas Island, the beach, everything, a jet ski for the first and, time. Yeah, and that was all in the eight mile bubble. And uh, yes. my, my jet ski, I think I hit 73 miles an hour on that thing. And I, I thought got... I hit 73 on mine. No, no. But you see, beat me. I, I beat you. Mine was the fastest. Um, shout out to Frank Hickman. The coach Frank Hickman. He gave you uh, his, he gave jet, me his ski. jet ski. And, That's uh, cheating. Yeah, that was kidding. it was amazing. And then I ran out of gas and I was stranded in the water. I know. I keep telling everyone that story, even on my Instagram. I I'm like, he the schmo got stuck. I got. I, so I went beached. I, I pretty much got beached with it because literally the, this is a man-made island, and then there's sand. So I I stood up when um my my jet ski ran out of gas over towards the shoreline, uh, like a little bit of a sandbar. And some root was standing up. My foot is still not the same. I cut up the bottom of my foot standing on that sidebar, and um, you, I still feel it now. I still have a, a nice little scar there in the bottom of my right foot. Yeah, but, you've been um, limping. I haven't been limping. Don't exaggerate. But overall, like you said, I felt safer there than I do here. It was a beautiful experience for us. It's something that we'll remember the rest of our lives. Great hospitality. Great hospitality. I I know we'll be back there. I know we will. Um, that ice cream, I, we spoiled ourselves. I think they have, they don't use cow milk, they use goat milk. So all of our food was buffet style, but it wasn't like a typical but buffet. Distance, it they distance. get it for you. It's like, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a team. It's a teamwork effort. Like yes. you tell the, 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 the floater person tells the, the chef, that floater person asks you what you want to order. They hand you the plate because they get the plate from the chef. They bring it back to you. They put on more food than, than you want, oh than you can gosh. eat. You feel like you have to eat it all. Yeah. We didn't gain that much weight because every time we st stepped outside, you sweat like hell. So crazy when I put my yeah. glasses on, you, you they it fog up, foggy. you can't see. Imagine taking the hottest days here in Las Vegas or the hottest days and somewhere like Scottsdale, Arizona, and mix it with the hottest days of Miami. The heat meets humidity. It's just something you don't really experience because it's so close to the equator. And it was just, it was a great experience for us because the hospitality was so nice. The heat was extreme. We did as much walking as we could, even yeah. in the dog days of the heat. Mm -hmm. um, so I loved it. And I love the experience and I appreciate what the UFC and yes. with Abu Dhabi, um, the culture and tourism there, yes. visit Abu Dhabi. Uh, they did such a great job hosting us, putting everything on. And um, I think my big takeaway is for all these other sports leagues, the only way this is going to work in this COVID era that we're in right now is if you do a bubble. There was no one who tested positive in that bubble. The locals exactly. that were working the event had to be quarantined for 14 days. And we had there. we had to take a test before we even flew out there. Yes. So, so we I knew. think that's a big thing too. Yes. Yes. And it, it's just uh, shout out to uh, Ed Etihad. That's the name of the airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, the Amazing sanitation food. was so great. The food was great. Their service was fantastic. Everybody was social distant. I just felt safe, mm -hmm. and I really like it there. And I hope we're back there for Habib and Justin Gaethje. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's that's <laughs> that's the that's uh, what I think would be the next time. So they're going to have events here in August and September. Yes. I think the realistically the next time we would be back at Fight Island would the earliest would be end of September, but realistically it would be October. Yeah. So October so would be the month. Um, and uh, we'll be back. That's the whole point. We'll be back. Yeah. So where was uh, have you've never been on that side of the world before? No, I've been, I've been to I've been to that side of the world. I've been to Israel a few times. Oh yeah, but um, I've never been to uh, and I and I think I've 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 like been towards Egypt and Lebanon, but I've never been really mm -hmm. that part. Of, I mean, that's that was still, my first time. That's still over like there. four or five hours. Um, uh, what's the direction uh, east mm -hmm. of that area? So it was the first time for both. We had no idea what to expect. Yeah, and we came back like an experience of a lifetime. Yes, and I even got to uh, wear proper head attire and everything. Yeah, you learn about that. That's you posted that. I posted that on the Instagram. Um, I put the wrong music though, but it was just people. Okay. That, you know, look. You know, there's comedy in what I do. I'm not perfect at what I do. 
Um, but uh, a lot of stuff's on the fly. Literally, I, I say our team is small. It's just literally you and I uh, <laughs> for the most part. And that's how that's all we need right now. Yeah. That's really all we need. So, you know, I appreciate so many people that reach out to Helen and I. Hey, I want to intern. I want to be on the team and everything like that. It's like, look, I don't have a perfect formula. I don't right now know how to. I, I, I will give you as much advice as I can when I see what you're sending and, and read. But look, you just have to go for it. You have to take chances and you have to be different. If you're not first, be different. Yes. I know Uriah Faber, that's not his specific quote but that's the quote he said to me and he yeah. got that from some marketing book or marketing person of but course. It, it's it's so dang true just be unique and be different and yeah. obviously take influences from people for me it's rodney dangerfield it's craig sager it's harry carey i mean i say these names all the time chicago second city legends mike myers john belushi chris farley i love those guys i study those guys and that that is what influenced this character and influenced me to be different. And that's why you're great. You know, I'm constantly inspired by you. And I think to piggyback off of what you said in terms of when people ask, you know, how do I get into this business or whatnot? Uh, I had a tattoo on my arm. I know you're not a huge fan of tattoos. It was the first one I got when during a phase where after... I quit swimming. I was lost. You know, you kind of go through an identity crisis and um, a tattoo. I spoke to my sister because I didn't know what to do with my life. All I knew was I thought I was going to be an athlete forever and I love sports. Um, and it says if I can't make a if I can't find a path, I'll make my own. And I think sometimes, too, the advice I would give some people is if no one's giving you an opportunity and no one's giving you a chance, create your own. And it's OK to take that risk. Like I would save up a lot of my money um, to, you know, in the beginning, buy time for eyes on the game. My sports show, I created everything from scratch. And it's because no one gave me an opportunity. Yeah, and uh, my friend, uh, former NFL football running back and ESPN analyst Merrill Hodge, uh, he's written books now, a uh, cancer survivor too. His mantra is find a way mm -hmm. and look, make it happen. Like everybody deals with shit. Everybody has yeah. different cards they're dealt with. Some people are born into better situations than others, but hard work cannot, cannot be taken for granted. You have to put the work in. You have to have the passion, the confidence, and the work ethic. And you can't shortchange that because at the end of the day, um, happiness is what we're all striving for. Everyone's looking to be happy. And money doesn't necessarily make happiness. No. Like the what you do it with your life creates those happy, happy means and everything like that. And that's why I'm so happy that uh, we're bringing on a really great guest today for our show. Um, and he's popping in here right now, right on time. Yes, Hop around here, Mr. Flash yeah, speaking Gordon. Speaking of happiness. Hi, Christina. How are you? It's fiance. Um, we have Jared Flash Gordon hopping Hello. in on the show. And this guy has a great story on so many different levels. He deals with so much adversity. I feel like every single time you got something going <laughs> on, my friend, there's a whole new story that pops up with you. And uh, I saw that you were in Vegas and I'm like, we got to have this guy on the show. And I appreciate you hopping on the Schmo Zone, my friend. And anytime you want to address a camera, number oh, three is all you. Yeah. Yes. And then uh, you can speak right through there, not on top, but right through here. Right and through it. Right through it. How you doing, my friend? I'm well. How are you? We're doing well. Just given the situation and circumstance, blessed that we could cover. Look at you, the man. Best sport. <laughs> yeah, this is awesome. The Schmo Zone. too, yeah. Our, our show right here. This is. I'm happy for you. I, I, we're not doing it in character. It's a little different. I know. It's He's definitely Dave a little today. weird. This is David. <laughs> yes, this is David. I like. I like this. <laughs> I, know, I like right? David. I like the schmo too, but you know. It's like Clark Kent. Superman. Seriously, uh, it's, you're like good looking dude. Like, uh, well, that's the, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you yourself as well, <laughs> but uh, but no, uh, oh, uh, seriously, in all in all seriousness, but no, that's a that's a. Um, that's a really, really nice way to put it. I, I look up to those super... I'm just a human being. I'm just doing what I, what makes me happy. Like, finding our own way, finding our own pathways, which I know you can relate to. Oh, yeah. Same. Uh, you know, people always tell me, like, oh, inspiration. And, yeah, I guess, you know, that's the whole goal, uh, to help people, help others uh, with fighting, with everyday life. But, uh, you know, I'm just a regular guy and uh, have good and bad days. And, you know, it's, a lot of days are worse than others. And... 
I'm just trying to put my best foot forward every chance I get and just keep on trucking. I mean, speaking of trucking, I saw the latest mm-hmm. post. You, you and uh, your fiance yeah. were literally on a road trip in an RV going to Zion, uh, the National for- National mm-hmm. Park, and uh, pfft, another disaster uh, yeah. happened and uh, another blessing to come out of it, right? Pretty much. Um, so like, we were heading to Zion, and we're on a two-way road. Christina's RV is 33 feet long. She's driving. Uh, Cars coming this way. We're going east on State Road 9 heading into Zion. And there's a car coming. And the the driver behind that car hops into our lane and starts speeding up. That's what it looked like to me. It was very fast, obviously. But so to me, it seemed like she was she was trying to pass the guy in front of her. And now we're going head on and we're driving like 50 miles per hour. She's driving about 50 miles per hour. So I had just used the restroom and I just sat back down and I was looking down at my phone and Christina screams at me. So I look up and I see a car coming straight towards us and we're like, and you know, we're lucky because Zion, a lot of times you're driving up cliffs. So if you go off the side of the road, you're going down a cliff. Um, Luckily there was like a, a space on the side of the road, kind of like an open field where we were able to pull over. So Christina starts swerving to the right. This car is still coming at us and she's almost coming like more into the lane. Uh, so after the accident, like a day later, we started questioning maybe, maybe this girl was trying to kill herself or she was just like out cold and just, cause how do you not see a 33 foot RV? What are you looking down at your phone or at the radio for t- t- 10 seconds now? So we weren't sure exactly how it happened. So Christina swerves to avoid the head-on collision. And this girl just takes out like 25 of the 33 feet of the RV. And uh, we were lucky, you know, we were really lucky. Uh, Luckily, Christina, with her athletic cat-like reflexes, was able to, and she luckily had her seatbelt on, so she was able to stay in the driver's seat stay on the break because there was a lot of stuff in front of us. If we kept going, there was like a ditch, fire hydrant, huge signs. Uh, There was people around also. There was a parking lot. So maybe we would have went through all that into a parking lot. There was a a store or a restaurant there. So it was very, uh, it was really dramatic and traumatic. Uh, Christina was definitely traumatized. I was kind of like, eh, you know, (laughs) another Tuesday for Jared, but um no, it was, it was scary, you know, and I got out of the car, out of the RV, and I was I was livid, and Christina got upset with me because she was crying, and I, I was like, stay right here. I'm going to kill someone. So I was expecting it to be, like, a group of, like, guys, like, young kids or something, and, you know, I got to the across the street, and it was, like, a young, really young girl, like, 18 or 19. She was crying. She was bleeding. I guess glass oh, from wow. the window broke on her. She had blood, like, on her face and her hands. So I was like, uh probably can't beat her up uh and then I ran back across the street and this lady was hugging Christina another another RVer who saw the whole thing we had witnesses and everyone corroborated our story the police uh put her at fault they ticketed her and you know we had to clean up the wreckage uh we had to drive the, an, an officer drove us to a rental car 40 miles away so you know we were like in the middle of nowhere and we had to we went to the hospital because Christina's back started hurting and her neck we were there for like four hours or something. Then we had to drive back to the RV. I had to rent a like a big, we rented a regular car and stuffed the car with all our stuff in the RV. Cause you know, that was like Christina's home for a while. So there was a lot of stuff in there, plus all my stuff. Uh, then the next day we had to get another rental car and we were in hotel. So it was a mess, you know, and so it's crazy. Great way to celebrate a big victory over Man. there in Fight Island with a makeshift uh, team, I know yeah. you spent so much time over with Duke Rufus in Milwaukee. Then you went to Sanford mm-hmm. MMA. A lot of people tested positive for COVID yeah. in that situation. You came over there. You had your buddy Paul Felder in your quarter. You have Eric, Eric Nixick down yep. the street from Extreme Couture. Literally put together a corner in a foreign country, fight island last minute. And by the way, you had a dominant victory. Thank yes. you. And against a really seasoned opponent. Chris yeah, for sure. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was a crazy week. Uh, we went through so much. You know, two weeks before the fight, Christina had a miscarriage. 
three days later, she was diagnosed with coronavirus. So I had to quarantine from her. I, I'm by myself for like eight or nine days before I left for Vegas to go to Fight Island. And everyone in my gym is getting coronavirus. So I just stayed by myself and I was, every workout I did was alone up until I left for Vegas, get to Vegas. I was testing, I was getting tested before I left for Vegas. I was testing, I tested negative like three times the week before I left for Vegas, just to make sure. I get to Vegas, I test negative there. They sent me to Fight Island. Paul was in contact with Dean Thomas who had coronavirus. So they made him stay there in quarantine. Insane. So I thought I wouldn't even have Paul at this point. Uh, so I get to Fight Island. I'm like, all right, I'm here, I did it. I get tested the night or that early morning at like 3 a.m. when we arrived. The next day, I get a call from Mick Maynard saying that I tested positive for coronavirus. So I was like, how? It's impossible. And now I'm freaking out. I got all the way here. I did everything I could to quarantine and stay, stay healthy. And I test positive. So I'm thinking, all right, fight's over. I'm done. Now I have to quarantine in Abu Dhabi by myself for two weeks. I would have just been getting home. Yeah. And that would have been miserable because it felt like a long time since I fought. Yeah. Um, so they test me again. I test negative. They test me another time. I test negative. They clear me. Uh, I put together my corner, Gary Tonin, Eric, Nick, yep. uh, Nick Sick, and Paul. Uh, and I go do my thing. And, uh, you know, I was happy with the performance, but I wasn't happy because I felt a little like I didn't have that pop and that explosiveness where uh, in other fights I've definitely felt more explosive, faster. And, like, I just kind of went in there with the intent on, like, you know, I wanted to have a great fight, dominating fight, which I did, but, you know, I just, I needed to get a win, and uh, I didn't have my my team with me. I just wanted to go in there and do what I do best, which is punch people, take them down, and hurt them on the floor, and that's what I did. And, you know, he's a seasoned black belt. That out of 18 wins, he had uh, has 12 submissions. He, you know, I had to fight out of some guillotines also uh, during the fight, and, you know, adversity comes in many ways for me. It came... It came in the uh, during the fight, and I overcame it. And 30, 26 every round, great fight, great win. My first fight back at 45, so that was another thing. Cutting weight, first time to 45 with all this stuff going on. No, no coaches by myself. Every workout was by myself in the room on that little balcony in Abu Dhabi, working out. I'm jumping rope. I'm shadow boxing. And uh, easy to lose weight in that. Heat. Oh yeah, it was 120 <laughs> yeah. degrees, so that helped. But you know, I made weight, got a dominating performance. Uh, awesome story. And uh, here we are with you. You are so mentally tough. Uh. I mean, I respect that and I admire it. And I just want to know, obviously, you know, having to deal with so much at once and then having to prepare for a fight and then not knowing, you know, who's going to corner you and everything. Going into that fight and still being able to have that dominant performance. I mean, what goes on in your mind to be able to be like, you know what, I got to turn the switch on now and then not think about everything that's happened all the distractions yeah so for me like like you said the switch it's always i feel like it's always switched on for me because i'm always coming i always have to face some sort of obstacle uh but first off i have god so i always have my faith and you know i know that whatever happens i'm going to get through it and i'm going to get to the next point and i'm going to level up and i'm going to be a better man so that's number one god but uh, you know, I, I face a lot of, a lot of other terrible things in my life and, uh, I was able to get through it. So fighting is just a privilege. I can go fight on ESPN, the only, one of the only sports on TV right now for the UFC in the greatest, biggest MMA promotion ever and be with my friends, be surrounded by people that I love and that I work with. So it's just a privilege. I'm grateful. And, you know, it's for me, fighting is not like a nine to five. It's something that I love and enjoy. It's my passion. So I get to do what I love and it makes it easier for me to want to go in there. And, you know, fighting like I've been hurt so many times fighting. I've had wins. I've had losses. Uh, so like it's just, uh, you know, it's fine. Once I get to the fight, I make weight. I'm like, all right, here we go. This is the, the, now this is the, the fun part. And so that's. So that's the that's like a no-brainer for me. Go in there and do what I do, you know? We were ragging Paul a couple weeks ago right after your fight um, here, yeah. because he did not keep the suit I on. Know. He had to switch the so Reebok So disappointing. Kit. So disappointing. But next time. Next time. Um, 
you float between fifty five and forty five. Are where where are you right now with your career? With with where you want to fight, and is it is it the best fight available, or where are you most comfortable with going forward? I'm staying at forty five. That's that's my weight class. I'm every time I fought at fifty five, even before UFC, I was the smaller guy. Uh, I'm like thick, but once I get down to like a low, you know, like pre fight camp weight, you know, I'm you could tell I'm I'm smaller guy. First of all, I have short arms. I'm like I have like a reach of like a bantam weight. I'm like a six. I have a 68 inch reach. Guys at 25 have longer reach than me. So if I'm not bigger than guys, I'm always shorter, or you know, sh my arms are always shorter too. So it's like I just I was able to win at 55 a lot uh, pre UFC and in UFC. But once guys start getting really technical and they're really big, it's like where do I find the advantage or the technical win you know advantage so at 45 i'm a big 45er and i'm i believe my skill set for that weight class is very it's you know it's very effective so uh 45 is where i'm staying i had one question that i've been dying to ask you too uh you spent a lot of time at sanford M mma uh there's two huge welterweights in that same gym mm -hmm. or at least were there's yeah. kamara usman there's Gilbert Burns. You got Henry Hoof, one of the best striking coaches out there. Uh, what was the dynamics of the gym like when it kind of really, we really found out that, hey, Gilbert Burns is next in line to fight Kamara Usman. Kind of how did that separation all transpire? So they're friends. Right. You know, they've been training together for years, and uh, they are the type of guys that are like, all right, this is business. And the coaches are the same way. There's no pick and sides. There's no drama like we've seen with other gyms in the past. Um, so when, when that happened, when they, when they announced that Gilbert was next, Kamaru kind of was like already decide, I think already deciding to go to Trevor Whitman's and he, so he was in the gym for a couple of days where the transitioning period was occurring and Gilbert was there a couple of days, but he had just fought. So he was kind of out of the gym. So there was no, like, they weren't in the room, like staring at each other, like sparring with other guys and, you know, or, or sparring each other. So. And it was super smooth. No one in the gym had a problem. There was no problem with the coaches, no problem with Gilbert or Kamaru. They're both stand-up guys, super respectful. And it's it's all it's a business. They both have families. You know, they both have uh personal, you know, goals. So they're gonna do what they gotta do. And you know, Gilbert deserves to be I I believe he deserves the title shot, and Kamaru obviously agrees. So they're gonna go do what they do, and they're both professionals about it. So it was it was easy for the gym to just have that transition period. And uh, like I said, he's also at Trevor's now anyways. So he still lives in Florida and he'll be in the gym apparently. That's what he told me um, when we were in Fight Island, you know, like between camps. And then when he has a fight, he'll head over there. So I don't, it wasn't a big deal for them. Now circling back to the featherweight division, obviously a lot going on in the top of the division. And I believe a few days ago, Dana White mentioned a possible trilogy between Max Holloway, Alex Volkanovsky. What do you think? Like, do you think there should be a trilogy between them two? I thought Max won the last one. Um, it was close, but he did drop him twice. 3-2, you had it? I had a 3-2. Yeah. Uh, he definitely, I think he, I, I'm pretty sure he won one, two, and three. And then the last two is where he, That's where I had Alex to. started to... Uh, you know, switch things up and adjust to the fight. But Max looked a lot better, and he is considered the best featherweight, I think, in history. Over in my Aldo? Opinion. Over Aldo? I mean, he beat Aldo twice, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, he might not have as many defenses or the period of being, you know, undefeated in the weight class. I think Aldo was, like, undefeated or, or was on a winning streak for, like, 10 years or something like that. But Holloway had a very comparable run, and he beat Aldo twice. So, I mean, runner-up between Aldo and and uh, Holloway. But uh, I think there should be a third one just to, like, cement it because obviously a lot of controversy with the last one. I clear. I think that Alex definitely won the first one, uh, but it wasn't like a – it's not like he knocked Max out and that was it, you know? like So it wasn't decisive. The second one clearly wasn't decisive, so – I think to like get the division moving, they should get in there again real fast and, and, and do it one more time. But I think what's really unique, you have what I think is going to happen. Nothing's been officially announced, but you're going to have Brian Ortega against the zombie. Mm -hmm. You have the end of the month, you have Zabit against Yair, Yair Rodriguez. Right. Out of those four, 
If uh, uh, if any of those four win, who's the most deserving for a title shot or be next in line? That's what I think is very unique because those guys are at the top of the heat, and you can make a case for any of them. Man, out of all of them, I think the zombie is the most dangerous one. Mm. I mean, they're all monsters, obviously. Yair has had a lot of ups and downs. Sabid is what five and zero or six and zero. Yeah, undefeated. undefeated. I know that in the UFC. In the UFC. Um. So, but he hasn't fought five rounds yet. I think with his fight with Qatar with Cater. Yeah. That if it was five rounds, it might have gone a different way because he yeah. started losing it in that third round. Um. And then you got Ortega who has had ups and downs. You know, he lost to Holloway, and then you have Korean Zombie who is just a freak. And I think that he beats Ortega, in my opinion. And then, although he lost to Yair, he was winning that whole fight. So, I mean, the division is stacked. Um, I don't know what will happen in the trilogy with Holloway and Volkanovski. Also, quarantine. So, they were, they were training during quarantine for that, for that second fight. Um, I think it's kind of at like a little bit of a standstill right now, the division. And... You know, there's so many win like all these guys have lost to each other and then beat the other guy and that guy who lost to him, but he beat him. So it's like they don't know what to do, I feel like. Uh, but it'll work itself out just like it always does. And we'll know soon, I think. But when are you hoping to get back in there? I'm trying to get in there. I was telling my manager October. So, you know, I've been on a on big, Fight Island. I guess that's where they're going to send me. And I think that'll be good because, you know, I've I've got to lay the land. You know, I know what I need to adjust as far as time differences, and I know how, you know, they're, they're, I mean, unless they change the schedule and the quarantine times and, you know, when they fly us in. Like, flying there was great. We flew business class, so I wasn't, like, in a coach seat for, for 15 hours, so that was easy. Coming back was great. So, I mean, uh, I'm down to go back, you know, and whether it's Vegas or, you know, I would love to get on the Khabib, the Khabib and Gaethje card. Uh... I had one, I, I've never been on a pay-per-view, and this will be my eighth fight, and I believe I deserve to, at this point, you know, I fought a lot of really, uh, I fought a couple of ranked guys, the two, I fought two guys that I lost to who are both highly ranked, the other guy I was beating, I tore my hamstring and I wound up losing the fight, but I was winning every round, so I think if like you look at my record, you're like, ah, eh. but then if you if you know what you're talking about and you look at my record, you're like, well... He's fighting in a he fought in a weight class he shouldn't have been in against a bunch of studs. So and then every time I you know I fight at 45 I dominate people. So uh, I think my record is very deceiving, and I'm kind of flying under the radar. So I'm gonna go on a tear and that's it. Is there someone that you guys have discussed you and your manager? Uh, Brian? We, we haven't discussed anything with my manager. I've spoke to other guys on podcasts about fights. Uh, I think Grant Dawson was brought up. I think that would be a great fight. He fought on I think the card after me. Uh, there's some other guys, uh, but up until this, up until I fought, I haven't been thinking about any of that because it was of my course. first fight back at 45. Then all of this nonsense happened to me with the fight and Christina. So it's been like, that's the last thing I've been thinking about. But All right, Brian Butler, we got to get you on a <laughs> pay-per-view card. Brian. Yeah. Make, make it happen. Yeah. Do um, something for me. <laughs> um, so you're here in Vegas. Are you training for the next fight here in Vegas with Coach Nixick, Gary Tonin? Are you going back to South Florida? Kind of what's your uh, lay of the land now? Uh, I'm going back to Florida. Okay. We're just here because this was part of the trip anyways. We were going to come to Vegas, and I was going to hit the PI and see Eric just to get some work in. And uh, But since we got to the accident, we decided not to drive back because Christina hurt her, hurt her back. So... It would be really uncomfortable for her. We have all of our stuff in a pickup truck, so we can't fly because we have too much stuff. So we're going to drive back in this pickup truck, but we figured let's take a vacay from our vacay and uh, get some rest and just chill. I know a really good massage therapist here in oh, Vegas. Really? If you need someone, we yeah, can talk after the show. We'll talk, yeah. yeah. And I saw, did you guys go hiking yesterday? No. Or was we, that Oh, a so that was an old pick. picture. That, oh, okay. Yeah, that was a throwback pick from... Uh, before we got into the accident, we were in Arches National Park in Utah, and we also did Islands of the Sky in Utah, and then the next day we got into the accident. We did a lot of hiking during our trip, but... Helen and I have been trying to get up there, so uh, we're, 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 we're picking at <laughs> so you for the advice. Don't, yeah. 
got into an accident. No, no. It's <laughs> we were thinking about going to Zion, Zion for my birthday, birthday coming up. Uh, St. George, if you were going to stay in a hotel, is beautiful. Beautiful town. We were like, we should move here. We got into an accident there. We were like, man, we should move here. I want to compete in uh, the St. George's Half Iron Man 70.3. Oh, yeah, when it's I was all talking said and done. to the officer about it, and it is hot there. Yeah. I mean, just like Vegas. So get ready. Better start running outside. Yep. Yeah. It's been a couple of years since I've really done those or trained, but uh, I'm going to get back into it. Dude. That's I, I have some friends that have done that course, and awesome. I've only heard great things about it. So, um, yeah. And then as far as looking at how the UFC is doing things and operating things, and we see other professional sports. I'm not sure if you've uh, taken a look at, at yeah. how the NBA has with the digital fans yeah. and everything like that. Weird, right? Super weird. It looks like they're, they're playing an NBA 2K game. <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't feel so real. True, yeah. And we have this successful bubble that seems to work. Obviously, this past fight card, um, some people have yeah. tested positive, but it's going to happen no matter of what. Course. It's just a numbers game. Um, What's that have to say with how the UFC is operating things against other professional sports? And do you think that eventually, because of being the only sport that's continuously having these events week in, week out, being on ESPN, being in primetime, that we could see MMA, specifically the UFC, really get in that conversation of mainstream sports like the MLB, NBA, NHL, NFL? Oh, definitely. First of all, I think Dana said, you know, set the precedent for sports during this time. Uh I don't know. I, I don't know how many cards they've had since the pandemic, but it's obviously it's obviously working. And uh, I mean, Fight Island to throw that together, and then the Apex. Uh, he's doing a wonderful job. Dane is the man. You know, he's affording us fighters the opportunity to progress our careers, make some money, and do what we love. So hats off to Dana and the whole UFC staff. They're amazing people. They're they're nothing but. You know, they're great people. Um, but I think we are getting to that point with the other sports. We're on ESPN now. And we've, you know, we're, UFC is what everybody's been talking about. Everybody's watching it. I mean, I'm sure you see on Twitter, like, all the celebrities tweeting about UFC. And, you know, a lot of these celebrities would be attending these fights anyways. So, I mean, we are mainstream now, you know, and it's only going to get bigger. I you know, I remember a couple years ago, it was the fastest growing sport, and I think we still are still the fastest are, growing sport, and we're it's going to be monstrous soon, and it's only going to get better from here. It's crazy to think that you haven't fought in Vegas, though, yet, right? No. In the UFC, because you made your debut a little over three years ago? Yeah, I made it in September. I had some injuries, so, you know, mm -hmm. I was on the sideline, then I had some other issues, then I had this... I, uh, this weight cut thing where I was trying to fight at 45 and prove I was a 45er. They were going to let me go back down a, like before I moved to Rufus Sport. And then I got to Rufus Sport and Duke was like, no, I don't want you cutting the weight. And I was like, all right, I trust you. You're the coach. Uh, I believe I should have been down there the whole time. Uh, I had some ups and downs at 55. I got a new contract under Duke. Then, you know, at this point, that was my third fight on my contract, my last one. So I should be up for negotiations on my my next contract. Uh, I'm at 45, um, and uh, you know, it's just I would love to fight in Vegas. I want. I, I'm dying to fight in Madison Square Garden, but now we got this pandemic, and New York, unfortunately, sucks as a state right now, uh, and that's my city. But you know, it's being destroyed, and. Uh, Vegas, Mad Square Garden, it's going to happen. I know it will. And I'm going to be in the UFC for a long time. And I know that this is just part of my destiny to get to the top and get the gold. And, like, I truly feel like I'm that guy that, like, not that people are counting me out, but, like, you know, I'm not, like, like say, Edmund Shabazian. Oh, big – you know, I'm glad I didn't take that route. How many people do we see that they are hyping up, hyping up, hyping up? And then they have a fall. You know, only a couple guys get through to that pinnacle level like McGregor or, you know, even someone like Zabit who's undefeated. Like, he's not talked about all that much, you know. So, I mean, like, I don't need that stardom. I need to work hard. I have one of the most effective styles in the game. And I make it exciting. I don't just lay on you. I take you down and I try to elbow and punch your face off. And my numbers, if you look at my stats... I had, like, behind Justin Gaethje, I was number two in uh, significant strikes in UFC history. At 45, my uh, significant strike differential is all-time in featherweight history right now, Between when I fought Fishgold. 
So, I mean, I put up numbers and I have an effective style that I know when I take you down and hold you down, you're not going to get up. And even if you do get up once, I'm going to take you down again. And then once you're tired, you're not getting up. So um, I have a sp specific style that people don't know. How I'm always going to be a step ahead of you when I'm on top of you. And if you take me down, I know how to hold people down. So that means I know how to get up because that's all I've drilled my whole life is holding you down and punching you and getting up if I get taken down. And I have an effective stand up. So I believe that I will go on a tear and get to that level. That wrestling base. Yeah. Can't teach it. No. Well, you can't teach it, but it's harder to teach it the older you get. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you do it, the longer in your career, uh, it's, it, it's very, very effective. You know, it's funny though, because I didn't wrestle. I wrestled the one year in junior high, but I wrestle, I've been fighting since I'm 17. I started as an amateur. So I've been wrestling for the last 12 years, but like in the gym, I'm not the best wrestler, but when I fight, I make it happen. Cause when I mix it with my hands and my feints and my level changes, I get in on your hips and I'll take you down. Or if we end up in the clinch, I'll trip you. Or, and I just make it happen to where I get up on top and I have really good cardio. So I'll beat you in the scramble. And even if you beat me the first time, I'll beat you the second time. So I end up on top. It's going to be a real hard time for guys, especially because I'm a bigger 45er. I'm not like fighting guys at 55 where I'm smaller. So I think uh, I think I got something going for me. Yeah, but to recognize that early on yeah. in your career and to take that as your advantage mm -hmm. over these fighters and to Definitely. continue to build on that, that says it all. Yeah. Um, you're a positive guy. I wanted to let you address you know the audience out there because a lot of people are struggling right now and yeah. i know helen and i paid a lot of attention to what you said in the your post-fight victory yeah. press conference you went up there and i just uh do you have a final thought that you can leave the schmo zone audience with on positivity and how to continue moving forward during these difficult times definitely um so obviously right now the pandemic your own personal struggles um it's hard to get through these things you know and for me, like I said, God is my, that's, you know, at the forefront of my life. You don't need to be a believer in God or whatever, or, but you need, you should find a higher power. It could be anything. It could be this bottle of water. If you think that this bottle of water is greater than you and has more effect on the universe than you do, then praise this bottle of water. It could be your mom. It could be your, your, your kids that you have to work hard for it. If your kids need to be your higher power for you to get to the next level, then let them be your higher power. Just because they're younger and their kids doesn't mean that they don't have a direct, um, you know, power over your life. So you need to find your higher power. You need to find your purpose, why you need to get to that point or to the next level. And you got to work your butt off. You got to work hard and you got to just keep having faith when things come to you and are, blocking you from getting to that point well you need to find a way around it or over it or under it and you just need to work hard and have faith and uh that's the bottom line and that's that's all i do you know and uh that's that's how i've i've gotten to this point and that's why i'm going to get further now final thoughts final thoughts okay. episode well, 27 we are all hoping you know to watch you on your first pay-per-view card hopefully in October, and yeah. we'll be there. Let's put it out there. Put the energy Yeah, out. put Positive it in the energy. universe. <laughs> yes, all positivity. Once again, I mean, I'm sure I'm like the millionth person to tell you, but your story, <clears throat> very inspirational. And like I mentioned earlier, I mean, being able to overcome so much and come out on top, come out, you know, very positive and have a good spirit, you know, that's very admirable. Thank so you. we're all looking forward to your return to the Octagon. Um, and... I just want to resend another congratulations to David, who's nominated for the World MMA Awards Personality Man. of the Year. When cool. I saw you at Fight Island, I was like, oh, Schmo's here. Like, I didn't know you were going to be there. And, you know, obviously they're probably picking certain, you know, MMA media outlets to come because they're not going to just let everyone show up to Fight Island. So when I saw you sit in front row, I was like, I don't know if you remember that. I, was like, oh, I do. It's, it's I appreciate small, that. My man, yeah. So to see you from where we were in that yacht that a yacht. year ago, where you were just starting to blow uh, up. That was April, too. It was that the end was, of that April. Was the yacht. That was the yeah. Fort Lauderdale. That was when I first met you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the Sunrise um, card. Yes. And I was like, to see from there to now, man, you've made great strides. I'm really happy for you. I appreciate it. And you said it yourself. You got to put in the work. Exactly. And you got to have That's the confidence. And you got to believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us here at the table and your fiance Christina can attest to that. Yes.
Definitely. This is episode 27 of the Schmozone podcast. He's Jared Flash Gordon, the USC featherweight. I'm Helen Yee, sports. <laughs> we put the sports in, it's great. Um, Dave Schmoltz in the Schmo, episode 27, the Schmozone. We're out.